الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهداه. Okay, um, this time around we will uh, try to cover. We by the by the way we have a lot of territory to cover. Uh, I hope we can uh, we can finish it this evening. We're going to cover a uh, a school of thought that is almost off the radar screen as far as all the Muslims are concerned. Everyone sort of is familiar with the, uh, what school of thought do you follow? Someone says a chef, okay, we're familiar with that. Someone says al Jafari, okay, we're familiar with that, etc., etc. But someone says, okay, I follow the Zahiri school of thought. What's that? So uh, not very much information is available uh, about this school of thought. And hopefully in this uh, condensed hour and a half or so we can uh, clear the air. Okay, what is al-madhhab al-zahiri? Well, madhhab, everyone knows what madhhab means. Al-zahiri, what does al-zahiri mean? What does the word mean? Literalist? Yeah, it could be construed as literalist. But the more... Um, Linguistic flavor of the word is the apparent. What is apparent? So uh, you want to say uh, is the school of thought that follows what is apparent. You 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 deliver the meaning. You want to say the literalist school of thought of those who are a little more literalist. Also, you're capturing some of the meaning there too. Okay, now what is all of this about? This school of thought says that, like just the other, just like all other schools of thought, that the source of what is called fiqh is the texts. And when they say texts and nusus, they're referring to the Quran, Kalam Allah al Majid, and they're referring to Al Hadith al Sharif, the Prophet's statements and uh, behavior. Uh, the, this school of thought says once those two quotes pertaining to any issue you may have on your mind but once you have these two quotes from the Quran and from the Sunnah you need no opinion there's no Ra'i so that's, that's you know very generalized uh, uh, capsulization of this school of thought. They they are against what it has become known as uh, Islamic opinions. Uh, so therefore, what follows, if if you're into the details of the fiqhi nuances, uh, Zahiri school of thought has no qiyas, has no istihsan, has no dhara'i mursala, uh, has no um, uh, I mean, said the They have none of these other ex, uh, mental developments that accompanied the other schools of thought when they wanted to understand what a particular ayah means or what a particular hadith means. Uh, so they just go right there to the text. You find it, that's the ayah, that's the hadith. You need nothing else. These other opinions that are floating around, they're just opinions. We're concerned with what the text is saying. Uh, and if there is no text, let's say there's an issue in life, and there's no specific text, no specific ayah, no specific hadith that goes right to that issue and uh, answers it or solves it, then they say, they, they use the ayah, huwa ladhi khalaqa lakum ma fil ardi jami'an, which it, it, the ayah means he, it is Allah who has created for you everything <coughs> that is on earth as a service or a utility to you. So they have something like what may be called a utility fallback, meaning that uh, all other things can just be considered in the realm of human activity uh, if they are not addressed uh, directly and comprehensively by the hadith and by the ayat. By the ahadith and by the ayat. 
So that, that's called in the language of the fuqaha al ibaha al asliya. Others would say al aslu fil ashya al ibaha. The the state of nature of things, the way Allah created them, uh, is permissibility, is uh, legality, is um, uh, utility. So that's what they fall on. If they can't find any meaning coming from Allah and His Prophet pertaining to a particular issue in life, then they say, well, you know, that has to be uh, uh, left up to uh, the better understanding of man to deal with it on the basis that everything is permissible. Can you so, give us an example? Yeah, we're coming to that. I know that's on your mind. I'm going to clarify this. Uh, they, so from this, uh, on this basis and with this background, they developed opinions that were contrary to the majority opinions that you would find in the rest of the Islamic schools of thought. In other words, they're looked upon as contrarians. Oh, you don't fit. Where'd you get that from? The, these types of things. That's how they're perceived by the other scholars of their time and up until today. Um, they're sort of pigeonholed uh, because of that. Uh, and now, well, let's take an example of what we're saying here. Uh, concerning the issues of inheritance, al-irth, um, all of us are familiar with the general Islamic law or principle that says, لِذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ For a male is the share equivalent to two shares of the female. So that's the general law, and there are many other laws that uh, evolve around this. It becomes mathematical, and it becomes you know nuanced, and there's a lot of um, uh, delicate differences when it comes to breaking this down uh, among the, let's say, mainstream fuqaha uh, in Islam. One of the issues that pertains to this is if a person is dying. If a person is, the question becomes now in the head of these thinkers in Islam, if, if a person is dying, does he have the freedom of allocating some of his possessions, some of his wealth, some of what is going to become his inheritance, the... Uh, uh, the amount of uh, assets that is going to be inherited by those who are who qualify to inherit him, basically his family, his nucleus family, and maybe some extensions here and there. So, if a person is dying, uh, could he interfere with these laws? Okay. Is a question that you know some of these fuqaha had to answer. And uh, the, the I, 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 of course, there's a lot of give and take in this, but I'm just giving you the shell, the, uh, the nutshell of it. And that is that uh, before, if a person is like, you know, I'm in good health, nothing's wrong with me, uh, and there's, no, one's pre uh, no one's predicting I'm going to die, uh, I got a clean bill of health, I'm in my full vigor, I can do with my wealth whatever I want to do as a father. No, no, no one disagrees with this. All the fuqaha say, okay, yeah, fine, you can do it. That belongs to you. Let's say you have a crippled son or daughter, and you want to give 90% of your belongings uh, to that uh, disabled uh, sibling that you have. You can do that. Anyone can do that. There's no disagreement up to... Now... What, what becomes, the gray area here begins to develop when the person is beginning to die. Let's say he's been wounded in, in those times. You know, someone has been uh, mortally wounded. He's going to die. Everyone knows he's going to die as a matter of days and he's going to pass away. Now, what, what do you consider a person like this? Can he, in this condition, can he allocate the wealth that he has, the, the assets, the possessions that he has to his offspring? Or can he not, or is, a limit, is there a limitation on this? And also, once again, 
The mainstream answer to this, I'm trying to pool the information that's uh, in the uh, in the books of all of these uh, fuqaha or most of them. It, the answer to that is no. He only has the liberty to um, uh, to allocate one third of what he has. He can't go beyond the third. So. Um, that's because, <coughs> that's because, I mean, the laws of inheritance would be annulled if you give a person who's dying the full freedom to do whatever he wants with, you know, with his wealth. So in order for that not to happen, there's this, uh, like this transitional uh, understanding of, w of what can be done with that wealth. Of course, if the person dies, doesn't say anything, then the laws apply. Nothing can be done about it at that time. Okay. So this is the general understanding among almost all of the fuqaha. Here comes the Vahiris, and this is what we're talking about. The Vahiris, here how they understand this. They said, no, 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 no. A person, even if he's dying, as long as he is in full uh, a control of his mental capacities, as long as he can think straight, he's not going through deliriums. And if he can think straight, he can do whatever. Just like when he's, you know, when he's not uh, dying, that's his wealth. He can do whatever he wants to do. And they argue against all of the other fuqaha saying uh, that their opinion doesn't come directly from the Quran and the Sunnah. It comes from what is called sadd vara'a, which is uh, they want to preempt uh, the possibility that um, fathers or mothers or whoever has some wealth that they're, they're going to pass down to their coming generation, that they will wreak havoc with the laws of inheritance. So the laws of inheritance have to be preserved, and to preserve them, there's this, this buffer issue here. So they, uh, the Vahiris took issue with that and said, no, no, no. It's not, there's, there's no one ayah or one hadith or a collection of ayat or a collection of hadith that demonstrate the validity of what you, the rest of you fuqaha are saying. So this, <laughs> this gives you a sense of why they're called the Vahiris or uh, the literalists or those who are... are, are um, more concerned with the apparent meaning of the texts. Texts here means the, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Uh, now, to demonstrate this even further, uh, there's a hadith from the Prophet, and all everyone agrees to this hadith that indicates that the urine of a human being is najis. Everyone agrees to that, so there's no no problem here. Now, when it comes to, okay, what do, you th what do you say about the urine of a pig? And well, the rest of the Fuqah said, well, by a, 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 a simple matter of analogy, P.S., if the urine of a human being is nedges, it's common sense that the urine of the pig is nedges. The Vahiri say, no, 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 don't play around with these, you know, don't play around with the text. There's no ayah or hadith that says that the urine of a pig is nedges. So why are you saying that? You come, the, 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 you come and argue with them say, well, everything else in this thing is nedges. Its meat is nedges. Its skin is nedges. It's, you know, these other things are nejis, it's a nejis animal, why are you exempting its urine from being nejasa? They say, we don't find any substantiation for that. Can you quote us an ayah or a hadith that substantiates that? And they can't. So there's, you know, a deadlock between the two opinions, or the two ijtihads. So now I have a sense of what we're saying when we speak about a Vahiri school of thought. Before now, we're going to go into the history and how this thing developed and came about. 
personalities involved in it. This has a history, it just didn't come about just like that. Okay. Uh, there are two scholars who stand out um, as the foremost scholars of the Zahiri school of thought. One of them is called Dawood, al, well in Arabic literature it's Al-Asbahani, in Farsi it's probably Al-Asbahani, uh, whose uh, obvious his origins are from Isfahan in Iran. He can, in a, in a very scholastic manner, he can be called the founder of this um, school of thought. Because he was the first one who began to express himself in this manner. The second major uh, and more popular individual who is known almost synonymously, you say a Vahiriya, is almost, almost automatically what comes to your mind is Ibn Hazm. Al-Andalusi. Ibn Hazm, who came from Iberia, which is today Spain, basically. I mean, Portugal is just one of the... Is that... Um, when did they live? Yeah, well, I'm coming to that in just a couple of minutes here. Give me a... Yeah. Uh, so Ibn Hazm had more uh, influence, and he had more to say, and he was much more uh, concerned with expressing this methodology of fiqh than uh, the, the uh, Dawood al-Asbahani who's considered to be the first one who blazed this trail or this understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Uh, Dawood al-Asbahani was born in the year 202 Hijri year and he died in the year 270 of the Hijra. So that's roughly the, the time period in, in which these types of, uh, or this inclination of thought began. Uh, Dawood al-Aswahani was a, uh, before he uh, began this uh, school of thought, so to speak, he was, as far as madhabs are concerned, he was, he was a Shafi'i, he belonged to the Shafi'i school of thought, and he was very impressed uh, with Al Imam al Shafi'i, considered him to be his mentor. Uh, he, he spoke and he wrote <coughs> about the virtues and the strong points of al Shafi'i. And in addition to him studying the Shafi'i school of thought, he also, Dawood al Asbahani, we're talking about, he also studied the Hadith. He uh, attended many sessions of the scholars of his time, the scholars of hadith of his time. Uh, he, he was also known to narrate the hadith. Uh, and he resided in Baghdad. Uh, his origins are from Isfahan, but he was living in Baghdad. So don't get these things mixed up here. That was considered his, like, uh, his country. Uh, but he did travel. He went out, out of Baghdad to places like Nisabur or Nishapur, depending on your language of origin. Uh, and when he first began expressing this, these, um, th this way of understanding the Qur'an and the Hadith, uh, he relied on the body of Hadiths that he had uh, memorized or understood or studied. Now how did, how did he transit from the fiqhi, from the shafi'i fiqh to this new, right now, um, this new type of fiqh? Um, a shafi'i used to uh, explain the Qur'an and the hadiths uh, in a manner that almost disguised the issue of analogy and uh, the issue of uh, extrapolation. Um, he used to uh, consider the Sharia to be a direct output of the Nusus, of the Qur'an and the Sunnah in other words. And the Shafi'i did have Al-Qiyas in his school of thought, but there was not uh, uh, an obvious emphasis on the Qiyas. 
So obviously, this, this being the intellectual climate that um, Dawood al-Aswahani was in, it wasn't very hard for him to say, wait a minute here, I don't know. I, I'm not coming. I'm not really creating something new. Uh, uh, Imam Shafi sort of uh, was generally in this ballpark. Um, so the uh, Dawood al Asbahani finally, almost you can say, broke from the Shafi Madhab and began to take on directly the meanings of the ayat and the meanings of the hadith, regardless of what all of the other opinions. And remember, you have to go back to the climate of the time. In that time, Baghdad and Iraq were, uh, just like the United States in the world today is, it was the, uh, if we want to use a word that's used by the media, it was the Mecca of the scholars of the world. Uh, people used to go there if they wanted to be educated, if they wanted to get some degrees, if they wanted to improve their level of knowledge, etc., etc. So remember, these, this person was living in that type of climate. It wasn't like there's a reaction here to something, or, <coughs> or there's not enough information around that this, this, this poor type of person is just uh, disregarding other uh, fuqaha other intellectuals, other scholars, and what they have to say. Uh, once he was asked, how come you annul al qiyas So he said, the same way a shafi annulled the istihsan, I, I'm just using the same method, I've annulled al qiyas if for those of you who are not very familiar with the word istihsan, the English word for it is approbation. Uh, that means that uh, in, in the absence of an ayah and the hadith and the qiyas, in the absence of these three mechanisms, and the ijma, and the ijma is another mechanism, you, you have the absence of these, and then you have some issue in life that comes your way and you find a solution that does not contradict the Qur'an and the Hadith. That's called istihsan. <coughs> you, 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 you devise a solution that is uh, favorable. Uh, approbation, uh, another breakdown of that word would be favorability. It, it, it's, it's a favorite choice to do something that is not in contradiction with, with in obvious contradiction with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Okay. What's yes, I'm sorry, I cannot just... Yes, is analogy. Um, okay, we're coming to this right now. In the language of the fuqaha, there's the word ad-dalil, evidence. They use the word ad-dalil, evidence. Now, where's your evidence? How did you come up with that opinion? How do you uh, tell us that this is the answer? So they, they go and they either cite an ayah or a hadith. This is called the evidence or ad-dalil. And usually or sometimes this dalil, we're going to take an example here to break it down for you has something like two segments to it, two portions to it, and the, the conclusion of these two portions of, of the evidence, the conclusion is not that obvious to everyone. Okay, and what does this mean? There's a hadith from the Prophet that says, Kullu uh, muskirin khamr وَكُلُّ خَمْرٍ حَرَامٍ This is a statement made up of like two sentences. Every intoxicant is a khamr, and every khamr is haram. Okay? Now, no one argues that this is not a hadith. Everyone agrees, okay, the Prophet said this, alayhi salatu 
But what do you understand from him saying this? this here's where we begin to encounter the differences and the range in the human mind. Remember, we've been looking at an ummah in history. We've been looking at different opinions. We've been looking at different uh, doctrines. We have been looking at different understandings. And, and right now we're yet encountering another type of difference at another level. So when someone says, Kullu muskirin khamr, every intoxicant is a khamr, and every khamr is haram. Is this hadith saying that every muskir is haram? You see? Our mind uh, put together does not think exactly alike. And some, some, uh, most of the, uh, the fuqaha said, yeah, if the Prophet is saying every intoxicant is a khamr, and every khamr is haram, therefore every muskir is haram. Most of the fuqaha understood it that way. When you come to the Dhani, he goes, no, 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 you're, 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 you're going too far. That's your opinion. That's not exactly what the hadith is saying. Read the hadith. The hadith is saying every muskir is khamr. But the Prophet didn't say every muskir is haram. He said, every khamr is haram. The word khamr means uh, any substance when consumed um, renders the mind, um, in, in the literal sense, renders the mind foggy. The word is in today's language, in today's world, is called sober. So, kullu muskirin khamini, every intoxicant affects the sobriety of man, his level of consciousness, his level of awareness, his ability to think, his ability to judge. This is what happens. But the Prophet saying, and every khamar, every substance that causes this, is haram. Now you can see this can become a very serious uh, argument, and it did become a very serious argument, because later on we're going to see that the, 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 um, the class of scholars of those times... Uh, they came down very harsh on this way of, of thinking and concluding things. Uh, the, uh, this is, you know, someone asked, what's P.S.? This is P.S. This is an analogy. The Prophet is saying, every muskir is khamar, and he's saying, every khamar is haram. So the analogy here is, therefore, every muskir is haram. Every intoxicant is haram. The Zahiri school of thought takes issue with this analogy. It says, no, 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 you can't do. You can't understand it that way. That's not. That's not what it's, what is meant. Uh, another another um, example. Can you give us an example of this every muskir? What's the? Give me one example that. That would fit into this uh, hadith that the Abdullah is not accepted? Well, you can say, uh, everything that intoxicates is, um, is khamr. Khamr at that time was made out, the, the, the working definition of khamr at that time when these words were used was made out of the extraction of grapes, uh, the fermentation of the grape juice into an intoxicant. That was called khamr. So khamr is a particular intoxicant. In the world of today, there are many drugs that are used. What's called substance abuse is uh, a form, uh, is a, another way of referring to muskir. 
when you when you read the terminology of the drugs that are being used, you have heroin, you have cocaine, you have um, crack, you have uh, amphetamines, you have all of these other substances that are intoxicating. Uh, and in addition to them being intoxicating, they also act like a, a khamar. They act like a khamar. They're not the khamar itself. Another definition of the word khamar in those times was the, uh, the fermentation of the, um, the juices that are extracted from dates, obviously, because most of this um, uh, most of this literature was in an area that was um, known for growing uh, the date palm trees, and they used to make drinks out of that. And some of those drinks that they used to make out of those extractions had to go through a fermentation process that ended up becoming uh, what is called chamer, uh the substance that impedes uh, the normal uh, awareness and thinking. Uh, the, the normal combined thinking and awareness capability of man. So uh, the fuqaha, the majority of them understood this to be a qiyas, an analogy, and therefore they said uh, unanimously that all intoxicants are haram. Uh, an exception to this, like we're saying right now and trying to explain, was the Zahiris that said, no, no, you're extending this, this is not what the hadith is actually saying. Is it clear, sort of? It needs a little more work on it. Do, do they, do the Bakhiris give like a physical example of something that's khamar but that's not an intoxicant? Or vice versa? I haven't come across them, uh, you know, giving something, but uh, I think the argument uh, really uh, uh, at that time, and given the world that they were in, uh, was whether this haram is limited to the khamar, the, the type of intoxicant that's made out of grapes and dates, or it could be extended to other substances in those times. I don't know whether they had, um, you know, some type of pot of weeds of some sort that can act in the same manner. That information really is not available. There were some other things. So do modern day Bahis permit uh, hashish or things like that? Or? Uh, you know, I guess it would depend on their level of understanding of things. If they, if they want to be really literalists, I mean they would probably not be advocating it or anything like that. They'd probably say it's makru or it's semi-haram, but they're not going to go to the extent of saying it's haram because the hadith doesn't say it's haram. Right. So is, is this school, I mean, is it overly permissive or is this just an example where they're permissive or other schools, are they also strict in the same way because of the literal interpretation? Or do they use their literal interpretation more to be permissive? Well, you know, with, this, with this type of uh, approach, and processing of the meanings of the ayat and hadith, no one accused them of being permissive. These were just moral people, just like everyone else. They were very conscientious of, uh, of what they were saying. We will see Ibn Hazm was a... Um, I mean, this person studied the philosophies of the time. He was an intellectual at the highest uh, standard of intellectualism and all of this. These No, no, they're... Just because they say something like they're saying something like this because as a matter of conscience, they're not saying something like this. And we want to break away from something. Wrong. No, no, they they want to try to be as conscientious and as precise in understanding these ayat as they can. And this is the way they came out understanding or these ayat and ahadith as well as they can. Uh, I was getting to an ayah. It says, "Qul ladina kafaru in yantahu." يَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ This is ayah number 38 in Surah Al-Anfal for anyone who's interested. And it says, say, Allah subhanahu is saying to the Prophet, to say, to الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِنْ يَنْتَهُوا If they cease their hostilities, their aggression, their belligerence, then Allah will forgive them whatever has transpired in the past of their hostilities and transgressions and belligerence. 
So when Advahidi looks at look at this, he says, Ladina Kafar. Allah is talking about specifically Ladina Kafar. Don't, they, they'll tell you, don't put words in Allah, uh, Allah's mouth, so to speak. They'll say it this way. He's not saying about. But the other fuqaha, once again, the overwhelming majority of all other fuqaha said, Ladina Kafaru here. Yes, it's saying Ladina Kafaru, but it also applies to those who have the same behavior, but may not have the same title, Ladina Kafaru. It could apply to Mushrikeen, it could apply to Zalimeen, it could apply to any other class of antagonists, not necessarily Ladina Kafaru themselves. So here, once again, you encounter a difference of opinion, a difference of interpretation, a difference of understanding. They, they sort of take this more literally. You know, Allah is saying, Ladina kafaru here now, come on, don't play around with words. That's what they'll tell you. So here, once again, in this area, inclusive in this area is, in the human mind, a form of analogy. Because if this applies to a ladina kafaru, it could also apply to those who fit this description. That Allah will forgive them if they cease their hostilities. But the Zahiri said, no, no, we're not going to accept that analogy. We don't accept the qiyas. This is what it is saying. This is what we understand it is saying. And this is its meaning. Don't build onto it more than what's in it. That's their opinion. Out of sincerity, nothing. They're not trying to, you know, play games here, defend some other classes of people or any. Other. No, no, no. They're trying to do this out of the goodness of their hearts and minds. Now, Dawood al Zahiri, the person. So you got a, a, an impression. You got a feel here. What we're talking about? Yeah, because you know we can't go on, you know, beating a dead horse. Uh, This Dawood, his name is Dawood ibn Ali al-Asfahani, also had uh, very sound knowledge of the hadith. But others would not uh, quote him because of the way he's thinking. They, they concede, this is a scholar, but we're not going to quote him. It was, what was beginning to happen was like there was a... Um, uh, 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 a scholarly bias against him. It was like the team of scholars, the consensus, the fuqaha in the world, just because they disagreed with this person, they're saying, we're going to shun him. Uh, don't, don't Forget about what he says, don't pay much attention to him. But the person in his own right was a scholar. Now also, there are other issues that were bouncing back and forth in those times. Remember the issue of khalq al-Qur'an, whether the Qur'an is created or not? What would you say this person person's opinion was. <coughs> is the Qur'an created or not created? Well, I'll tell you. He said the Qur'an was created. Yeah. The Qur'an was created. So when he said that, and knowing the dynamics that we covered in past uh, presentations, and how the pendulum swung Oh, you see, the time that he was speaking in was the time after the, the, the peak, during the time of al Ma'mun, when the Abbasi state um, sponsored officially the opinion uh, that the Qur'an is created. So after that receded, this was the time when public opinion had turned against that opinion. So, uh, that not opinion, in his point of view, he thinks this is the understanding of the Qur'an and the Hadith. So he was, all, because of this, yet another factor went into his um, uh, being isolated by his uh, uh, ulama'i peers. Why did, why, what was his evidence for saying the Quran was created? Well, you know, we, we cover this type of territory, and the evidence is the same as those who did say the Quran was created. And... and uh, I hope these things are available on the, uh, yeah, on the website. They should be on the website. But the particular issue was, and I'm, I'm distilling this uh, tremendously, was that those who were opposed, or those who said that the Qur'an was created, were defending the Islamic faith and doctrine from uh, the intellectual creep 
if I can put use that word right now, of some of the Christian scholars of those times who wanted to trap the Muslims mentally. Because if the Muslims are going to say that the Qur'an is not created, like many of the scholars were saying, uh, then the, the, uh, the Qur'an is Allah's words. Muslims can see the Qur'an is Allah's words. And then in the Qur'an, which are Allah's words, Allah says that Isa is Allah's word. وَكَلِمَتُهُ أَلْقَاهَا إِلَيْهَا Isa is Allah's word which he placed unto Maryam. Okay? So if the Muslims are going to say the, the Qur'an is not created, then they're falling into the trap that it's equivalent to saying that Isa is not created, which would be conceding divinity to Jesus. And the rationalist school of thought in Islam at the time picked up on this and said, we're not going to fall for this. And the Qur'an is created. And there, thereby you had this almost uh, consuming civil war that was going to destroy the internal house of Islam at the time. But it seems that that was using Qiyas. <coughs> what? Is that when you say that you know, Isa is uh, um, the word of Allah, and the Quran is the word of Allah, so therefore Isa is created, therefore the Quran must be created. It doesn't seem something like that, that the Dahis would have done. Yeah, the arguments... The the a part of the argument no the Vahidis are, are intellectual people and they have their opinions and they have their discourses and they have the way of explaining themselves they, they, yeah they may not in, in be, uh, have been involved in argumentation but the development of uh, khalq al-Qur'an the issue of khalq al-Qur'an the Vahidis were not responsible those were the Mu'tazilis that's a, that's a whole uh, whole other ball game so the ulama, when they noticed and they sensed that this person here says that the Qur'an is makhluq, this was another quote-unquote in our time, you know, the bid'ah accusation. They threw this bid'ah accusation on him. Look at this guy, he's a mubtada. So there's another layer there of isolation that was placed on, on a person who's just believing. I mean, we have to concede that when they express themselves as scholars, they're doing so uh, out of their uh, sincerity to Allah and His Prophet. And it's very uh, unfortunate in covering this history that th at least this cannot be shared among scholars. There has to be this type of uh, bad feelings among scholars. Uh, you can agree with them, you can disagree with them, that's, you know, yeah, that's up to you. Uh, but you, you sh there shouldn't be any type of, uh, you know, attempt to exclude him from uh, the intellectual public <coughs> domain. Okay. Uh, one of the uh, issues that um, developed in this fiqhi uh, give and take between the Zahiris and the other Fuqaha uh, is the Qur'an itself. You know, there's an ayah that says, لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَهَّرُونَ And it is understood by the mainstream scholars that if you are junub, whether it is the major janaba or the minor janaba, you cannot uh, open the Qur'an and read it. You can't touch the Qur'an. Allah is saying, no, that's not right. Where do you give us give us an ayah that, that says so? And so what developed in, in in this contention of opinions was the difference between the word lamasa and massa. <coughs> lamasa means physical touch, and massa means impact or influence. So those who can interact with the Quran with impact and if and, and uh, influence are those who have tahara. But that doesn't mean you can't touch the Qur'an. You want my opinion? or? <laughs> <laughs> You 
the Quran is supposed to be an open book and you're inviting people to it, you would think that, you know, one of the, one of the um, facilitators of Islam is for the Quran to be accessible to all people. Let them read and understand what's it. They don't just say you can't do that because of issues that pertain to Tahara. So, you're beginning to get a sense of what we're talking about here, and that's, that's very important. Another thing that happened with Dawood, this scholar here, uh, when he was living in Baghdad, he was living in the time of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And he wanted to meet Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Ahmad ibn Hanbal would not agree to meet with him. He tried and he tried and he tried. He said, no, no, don't, I, I will not accept him in my, uh, in my class or in my jalsa, in my study circle, so to speak. So what did he, this person was so sincere, he wanted to listen to a scholar. He wanted, so he went to Ibn Hanbal's son, Salih, one of his sons. He said, please, you know, your father, he knew him, they were on, you know, one-to-one -one basis. Your father doesn't want me to attend this class, and I, I, I'm concerned, and I really want to attend. And could you convince your father in any which way, and all this? So he goes to his father, and he, he tells him, "Father, you know, there's a person who wants to attend your class." And he said, uh, "Who is he?" He said, "Well, he's an." Ad he don't want to give his name because if he gives his name, he's going to tell him no. He said, "Well, he's an admirer of yours, and." Uh, you know, he's been thinking about coming to this class for a long time. It's just that he's, I don't know. He wants your approval to come to the class. He said, but tell me who he is. So when he told him, he said, no, no, I'm not accepting him to come. I will not let him come to the class. And he didn't let him come to the class. You see, this is, when you read something like this, it makes your heart ache. Why? What's wrong? Okay, you disagree with him. Well, people disagree with each other. But why can't we listen to each other? Oh, you have what to say. Say what you say. And if he has his opinion, or you can say, you know, if you're in, in the class that, you know, you don't want any feedback from him or something like that, that's a different issue. But to say you can't come and attend the class, it really, you know, it strikes you as uh, somewhere out, you know, it just doesn't fit. Uh, but it's part of our history. Is it possible that, I mean, was, was his personality at all confrontational? Or no, that he, was no he, wasn't, he wasn't known to be that, of that type. He was a very eloquent person uh, and he, he expressed himself in, in ways that everyone understood. He was uh, witty. Uh, uh, he could, he could uh, substantiate what he's saying. He wasn't a person in lack of evidence or tell me why this is that, and then he's there thinking about, no, no, he had answers. The person was a scholar. Ibn Hanbal, wasn't he the one who didn't eat the orange because the Prophet didn't eat, didn't eat orange? It's reported to say that, yeah, he would, he, well, he, would he refused. He would refuse I mean, in a sense that... Was it a losing one? Literally, yeah. Well, if you take one one issue, you'll find that yeah, there's some common grounds. But generally speaking, no, there's there, there wasn't very much similarity. Uh, uh, also, Dawood Vahiri was known to be very frank. He was known to uh, to speak the truth uh, whenever he felt the need to do so. But here he was telling Ahmed ibn Hamad al you know, look, I'll go. And I'll, you know, I'll, 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 I'll keep my, uh, I'll keep my composure. I won't get nervous. I won't speak out. I won't. He conceded a lot that an average human being should never concede just to go and sit down with a scholar. But yet he was turned down and turned away. Um, he was also known to be what in today's world is called a a pious person, um, uh, very observant of his moral standards. Uh, he also uh, was of limited means. He wasn't, he doesn't come from an affluent family or an affluent background. Uh, he also, like other fuqaha before him, 
Uh, these people, when they become scholars, some people want to be nice to them and bring them gifts and um, um, tokens of appreciation and these things. He would not accept that. Um, he was very humble. He was a very humble person. And he was what, in today's uh, uh, wording, was he was like a, a very a, a people's person. He would be found just among the people. Um, some scholars, they uh, sort of uh, put a little distance between them and, and the average people. He wasn't one like that. He was a person who was intermingling with the populace in the markets, in the masajid, everywhere. Just a normal, what we call just a normal person coming and going. Uh, he never thought of himself as being superior to others just because of his knowledge or just because of his quote-unquote religious uh, credentials. Uh, one of the things that you should know is Dawood. Remember, this is the, the person who who uh, blazed the path of this madhab. Um, he absolutely was against taqlid. You know, everyone knows what taqlid is. He was 100%. This is mamnu'a, man'an mutlaqan. No one ever should follow anyone else. And of course, this also begins to put him at odds with the others who had a lot of followers and a lot of, you know, admirers and uh, these... No, this is Dawood al-Aswahani, the um, considered maybe the teacher of Ibn Hazm. Uh, he even said, Ayami, Ayami means an edu uneducated person, a commoner. Ayami cannot, um, cannot apply this taqlid. It doesn't even apply to the Ammi. So what does Ammi do? Abu Dawood, uh, I mean Dawood al-Swahani said, Yajtahid. <laughs> Whatever knowledge, even if it's this much, he has to build on that little knowledge he or she has. And if it comes to the individual who has, I mean, flat, no knowledge at all, doesn't know what to do, they ask him, what does he do or she do? He says, then he will ask someone else. Ask to obtain information, not ask to become a muqallid. He's just against it. He was strongly against this type of thing. And then if, if he, in going about asking, no one's giving him the answers that he can understand, he keeps on asking. It's his, this is part of building the potential for ijtihad. He keeps on asking until he ob ob obtains the answer that he can build upon for the future. So that he can reason why he's doing things. So he believed everyone was a mufti. Well, he didn't use the word mufti, but he believed everyone had access to the nas to the ayah and the hadith. Don't, don't uh, impede that access. A taqlid impedes that access. I'm trying to, my best understanding, and I'm trying to give you uh, what he would say. If he was here and you were asking him, he'd say, this is, you know, you're interfering with this dynamic. These ayat and these hadith uh, flow normally and naturally to every human being. Okay. But he didn't say anything about in, in, uh, in places where Arabic language is not the main language. How do people uh, follow the Quran when they don't understand it? Well, that's what he's saying. If, if it's flat, a person just doesn't know anything at all. He asks. Let's say someone is in, because later on this madhab is going to become very uh, predominant in Spain. And um, uh, Spain is not, well at that time of course because it was ruled by Muslims, Arabic was 
uh, a language that was used by most of the people, but it wasn't the historical language of the people there. So you'll find degrees of ignorance and degrees of uh, unfamiliarity with the language. But he would still tell you a person still has to learn for themselves. So they can go about asking. And that process is much better than just following someone else. That someone else is responsible for their lives. You're responsible for yours. So at least gain some information. Because this taqlid can also hamper, can also impede gaining information that is required. So in his opinion, just having little information that you personally gained is but better than not having any information at all and taking the word of someone else. And of course, when the other scholars uh, knew about this, they, they said, you know, this, you know, I don't want to put it in these words, but when you read these things, it's like, this person is crazy. Because what he's doing is, he's making everyone a mujtahid. Uh, we're gonna, you know, everyone can say anything and the, the, the ball is lost. What's going on here? So, as you can imagine, this was yet another element that went into um, uh, isolating him from the potential that he may have had in the larger public. But with all of this, it seemed like this madhab began to spread. These were the dynamics at work, and this madhab began to gain adherence. Uh, it, 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 it reached at one point the, <coughs> the other uh, fuqaha and the other scholars of Islam considered the disagreement of the zahiris to be irrelevant. Meaning if there's going to be ijma' it's considered the ijma' of the other fuqaha but these types even if they agree or disagree with them it doesn't count. So if they disagree on, on a certain thing, you know, who cares? The reason why this uh, madhab began to spread uh, was because of the books that were written and because of the students uh, that this person had, this uh, Dawood al-Asfahani. Particularly, he had a son, his name was Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Dawood. He helped a lot, his father, in uh, popularizing uh, this approach to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Uh, I'm, trying, <coughs> I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to uh, condense this. Okay, so the madhab, this madhab uh, spread throughout the four, third and the fourth centuries of Islam. And where, would it, where was it spreading basically? This person was where? Baghdad. Baghdad. So it was spreading in Iraq. It, it spread in Iraq to a degree that was considered the fourth madhab. Uh, after the Hanafi, the Shafi'i, and the Maliki madhab. It was more popular than the Hanbali Madhab. The Hanbali Madhab at one time was, uh, uh, was very popular in Iraq. But at, at, at one time in, that, in those 200 years, uh, this Madhab was way ahead of the Hanbali Madhab uh, in that particular geography. Um, but in the 5th Hijri century, there was one of the students, his name is Abu Ya'la, student of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he, he came and he turned the tide against this madhab in Iraq and he began to shrink. Okay, um, now we go to this madhab in Al-Andalus. Uh, and there we encounter a person by the name, he's known, everyone knows him by the name Ibn Hazm. Um, And there was a type of, you can consider it, intellectual skirmishes between Ibn Hazm in Al-Andalus 
and Abu Ya'la, which, who is Ahmed ibn Hanbal's student in Iraq. These two were at each other uh, exchanging different opinions and the Muslims in between were um, more or less tuning in to these types of differences. So how did this madhab uh, transit from Iraq to Al-Andalus? How did it make that uh, move? Uh, in the third century, Hijri century of course, a significant amount of scholars went from Al-Andalus to Baghdad, to Iraq. Uh, Baghdad and, and Iraq at that time, as we said and as we know, was the, um, the hub of Islamic intellectualism. Uh, most of these ulama who went to uh, Iraq were from Qurtuba, Cordoba. Um, and of course they went seeking knowledge, just like people go to universities here in the West, you go to obtain your degrees and all this, so they were going to, in a similar fashion, obtain their degrees. And some of them, while they were there, they met with the scholars of the time who were in Iraq, they met with the Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and they met with uh, Dawood al-Aswahani, and this Vahiri school of, of thought. And these were, like students and scholars, they were just there for the a benefit of understanding these scholars and by understanding them they took this understanding back with them to Al-Andalus and they began to explain what Dawood al-Bahiri is saying and what Ahmed ibn Hanbal is saying and what other fuqaha of Islam are saying to their own people in Al-Andalus and uh, from here on, <coughs> the Vahiri school of thought began to pick up admirers. Some people uh, began to say, that, oh, this makes a lot of sense. And they became interested in this Vahiri school of thought. Uh, one of them in particular, his name is Munzir ibn Sa'id, who died in the year 355. He was a Qadi, a judge and uh, an articulate speaker in Al-Andalus. And uh, in Al-Andalus, Al-Zahiriya, uh, after the return of those ulama and um, after their um, contact with their own people in Al-Andalus, the Zahiri school of thought was more popular than the Hanafis, than the Shafi'is, and the Hanbalis all together in Al-Andalus. The only madhab that was more popular than the Zahiri madhab in Spain was the Maliki madhab. And later on there's going to be a, a, a type of uh, clash of wits between both sides. Uh, there was a particular scholar in Al-Andalus, his name was Mas'ud ibn Sulayman. He died in the year 426. This was the person who uh, became the uh, primary influence on Ibn Hazm. He was the one who uh, taught him and influenced him into this Zahiri school of thought. Uh, this Mas'ud was known to have been what, what in our time uh, we refer to as a liberal thinker, a person who thought for himself. And he didn't consider himself a follower of any particular madhab. And he also didn't believe that there should be this type of taqlid to any type of scholar. If there's going to be a taqlid, it's taqlid to the Prophet, you know, make taqlid to this scholar or that pro uh, scholar. <coughs> um, and this was another one of these humble people. Remember, we're, most of the times we're speaking about very humble people, uh, very very scholarly people. And um, he always used to consider knowledge to be his prime objective. He gets it from anywhere he can, and he'll get it from anyone he can. There were no obstacles in that regard. 
his goal was knowledge. Now don't give me this person or that person or this place or that place. Okay, now Ibn Hazm was born in the year 384 and he died in the year 456. That gives him a life of how long? 72. Very good. Are you math major? <laughs> Okay, what's Ibn Hazm? Everyone knows him by Ibn Hazm. But what's his real name? Ali ibn Ahmed ibn Sa'id ibn Ghali <coughs> ibn Salih. I don't want to give you the, 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 the two grandfathers that I, that I reached right here because I know if I mention it, my God, it's going to just interfere with all of your thinking. So I don't want to mention it. Maybe, you know, remind me a couple of months from now, I'll tell you. But I, I want the ideas to get to you before, you know, we, uh, we sabotage our thinking abilities. And I don't know if it's mentioned in that other book. There was another book. I don't know if you're reading ahead of me, but... Uh, uh, I just don't want to mention it. Uh, okay, so he was known as Abu Muhammad. You know, over there, Abu, 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 you know, Abu. So they called Ibn Hazm Abu Muhammad. His title was Ibn Hazm. His father was Ahmad, and he came from a very well-known family that was supportive of the Umawis in the Andalus. A little history here, I think, is in order. Back in the East in what is today Iraq and Syria, there was a rivalry between the Umawis and the Abbasis. And the Umawis were on their way out. Popular opinion was turning against them for what they were doing politically to the rest of the Muslims. And um, some of them, when they left, when they were on their way down, and the Abbasis were on their way up, uh, they left from um, the Levant and they went to Al-Andalus. And there they became the rulers of Al-Andalus. And <coughs> one of the families that identified with this Umawi ruling class in Al-Andalus was the family of um, Ibn Hazm, his father, was an employee of that ruling uh, administration in the Andalus. Uh, can I skip something here? Huh, I'm right. Okay, there are so, there is some information that says that the origins of Ibn Hazm. He comes, if you want to trace his pedigree all the way back to when, uh, some people can trace it to Persian origins. Of course, this conflicts with the information that I withheld from you <laughs> a few minutes earlier. I just wanted you to know, though. Um, There's a uh, very uh, well-known scholar who wrote some books about, um, um, about history and historical personalities and uh, influential um, scholars and the rest. His name is Abu Hayyan al-Tawhidi. Um, he sort of denigrates Ibn Hazm um, with a type of libel uh, saying that he comes from a Persian background and his particular ethnicity is unknown uh, and that his family was up to a generation or two only a Christian family <coughs> now this 
this uh, particular narrative of history contradicts the other information about Hazm that go that trace him all the way back to Arabia or to Persia. But it's out there. I just wanted you to be aware of it. I'm not saying that's exactly what it is, but it's something that you should be aware of. Uh, you know, many of these fuqaha, the exact day when they were born was not really known. But in the case of Ibn Hazm, we know exactly when he was born, to the hour, almost. He was born on the last day of Ramadan, in the year 384 Hijri. And on that night, he was born between Fajr and Shuruq. We have a pretty good idea of when exactly he was born. He was born in the eastern part of the city of Cordoba. Cordoba. Has anyone been to Spain, by the way? One. Well, keep this in mind for future reference. If anyone goes to those areas, that's, that's one thing you want to keep in mind. And at that time, Cordoba, of course, was almost... Uh, trailing Baghdad as far as uh, being the intellectual and the scientific and the cultural and the modernity capital of the times. Um, and this Qurtuba uh, had a, a, a dual, it's like, like Istanbul today almost. You know, they pride themselves on being Europeans and Muslims at the same time. There was that type of sense in Qurtuba that you know, we're Europeans, but we're Muslims also, and that type of thing was there. Um, so he was born with, into a family that was um, uh, that was part of the administration of the country at that time, and it was a rich family. Remember the fuqaha that we've covered so far? None of them, we could say, were... I mean, Abu Hanifa was a merchant, he was well-to-do. and all, But here when we speak about Ibn Hazm, his family was, you can say, I think comfortably aristocratic. At least for a time period. I mean, later on their fortunes dip. But for at least the first 15 years of Ibn Hazm's life, he was living in a in an upper-class family. Um, and he was always, um, from his young age, he was always uh, a bright and a, uh, a thinking person. He always wanted to learn. That was known about him. And having this money and having this luxury around him did not impact this desire in him in any negative way. It didn't, influ it didn't have an influence on him at all. He wanted to learn. So he, he began at a young age by memorizing the Qur'an, like many of these fuqaha have done. And in, this, in his particular case, being that he is from this upper class family, he had a lot of his women relatives take care of him, and they were the ones who had him memorize the Qur'an. He didn't go to a shaykh, he didn't go to a halaqa, he didn't go to a school, uh, per se. I mean, he went to school, but it wasn't for the purposes of memorizing the Qur'an. The memorization of the Qur'an came from his own relative women folk. And they took very good care of him, especially when he reached the age of uh, hormonal agitation. There's another word for them. I just use this word to be a little mild with you. Uh, they took care of him not to, uh, not to fall into sin and, um, and go wayward. Um, but then at the age of 15, the fortunes declined. Not drastically. Not, we're not looking here at a person who went from, let's say, the upper bracket income to the lower bracket income. No, no. It's just that, you know, maybe went from upper class to middle class. That was the extent of it. It wasn't a, 
a socio-economic downfall. No, no. He still was living uh, somewhat comfortably, albeit um, almost, um, I don't want to say on the run, but because what was happening politically at the time caused his own family to leave Portoba. They had to leave. And so he had to li live with a family that's on the run or on the move, no longer stable because of the political climate of that time. Um, so he began to experience some hardships that he didn't experience before, but he had a robust determination. Um, they went from Qurtuba to a place called Maria. Now I don't know, I didn't have the time to go to the map and try to figure out how this Arabic word, um, what the Latin equivalent on the map would be. Of course we're not going to have many Arabic maps that are going to show us uh, this uh, available to us here. But he had, went to this other place, moved him and his family from Qurtuba to Maria, al Miria. Okay, so he studied the Qur'an, he, after memorizing the Qur'an, he studied the Hadith, he studied uh, logic, he studied philosophy, and then after that he began to study the fiqh, this particular area that we're speaking about. And he began studying, obviously when you have the madhab of Malik, the predominant madhab in the country, he began studying the fiqh according to the Maliki madhab which was overwhelming in Al-Andalus as well as in North Africa at the time. Um, it's <coughs> one of the uh, uh, one of the developments in his life was <coughs> when he was living in the Arabic word for this city is Balencia. Who knows what it is in English? Valencia. That's right. They were living in, in Valencia, and uh, he went to a study circle of fuqaha, and he asked about something, uh, a, a fiqhi issue, and the answer that he got...